I realised what culture was. It was simply the behaviours of the leaders. All right, so I'll say that again. It's the behaviours of the leaders and the centres of influence. The depth of the human psyche is crazy. So as leaders, we need to actually bring all that complexity and go, right, who are we? What do we stand for? How do we systemize culture? How do we not leave culture to chance? Who are we as individuals and what natural strengths do we bring to the table and gifts do we give to each other? How do we harness the good in this group, discard the bad and make a culture code out of it? Then how do we conduct honest conversations wrapped around who we want to be and what we stand for? Welcome to another exciting episode of the podcast, The Thought Leader Revolution. I'm your host, Nikki Baloo. And boy, do we have a pair of exciting guests lined up for you today. One of our guests is a repeat guest. He's a dear friend of mine. He's been a client of mine. We're mates. We hang out. We do stuff together. <laughs> the other one is his dear friend and business partner, who's an absolute legend in the sport of Australian rules football. But he's become an even bigger legend now in the world of culture building in business. I am speaking, of course, of none other than the two, the only, the legendary Emil Studham and Paul Ruzi Ruse. Welcome to the show, Em and Ruzi. <laughs> hey, Nikki, how are you, mate? Good to see you. have had a couple of coffees before the show started. So. <laughs> <laughs> he he doesn't drink see, coffee, mate. actually, Ruzi. <laughs> 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 uh, no, um, good. Thanks for having me on, mate. Appreciate it. It's really good to connect. It's really good to connect with you as well, man. Great to have both of you men on here. You know, gentlemen, this show is a show that champions the individual, champions the entrepreneur. We're all about helping people discover that true genius within and create a magnificent personal brand with it, a thought leader personal brand, because as a branded thought leader, people can take their business to another level. They can live in that zone of genius and that zone of success, bigger, better than ever. And we believe in freedom, in free expression and free enterprise. We are massive stands for that. So we bring great guests like you folks on who've already got their, their thought leader brand dialed in to a great extent and also are big stands for freedom and free expression and free enterprise. Because we want you to inspire the people to listen to the show, we, but we want you to teach them. We want you to give them strategy. We want you to give them tactics. We want you to give them a fire under their rear ends to get into action. But before they can open themselves up to you and really take it in, man, they got to get to know you. They got to understand who you are. So they fall in love with you just like I have. So let's start with Ruzi, then we'll go to, to Dragon here. Tell us your backstory. How'd you get to be the great Paul Roos? <laughs> yeah, so I grew up in Melbourne, um, in Victoria, in Australia. Grew up as, played a lot of sport, you know, so I'm 58 now. So, you know, when I was playing sport, was in the, you know, born in 63. So I started playing sport in, you know, late, late 60s, early 70s. And in Australia, Australian rules football is the biggest sport. You know, it's a huge sport, always really popular. You know, I played basketball, tennis, I uh, yeah, enjoyed school, but school was just a fill-in time, to be honest, from 9 o'clock till 3 o'clock, yeah, between the, 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 the main sporting hours. And then we had a system where it was a draft system, so you, which was really cool back then. So, you know, where you lived, you got drafted to a, a team, a professional team, semi-professional in those days, but Fitzroy was my local team in the main competition. So I was really lucky got drafted to Fitzroy as a... As a 16-year-old, they have an under-19 competition, which is sort of the minor league. Then they have a seconds competition, and if you're good enough to play seniors. So I arrived at Fitzroy in 1980, played the first senior game in, in 1982. Then I ended up playing 13 seasons with the Fitzroy Football Club, became captain. And around about the mid-90s was when it became fully professional environment. And by that stage, I transferred to the Sydney Swans. Uh, played for the Sydney Swans for four years, went to played in a, in a grand final, but didn't win a grand final, which is the Super Bowl. To give you listeners of 100,000 people, rock up the MCG last weekend of September. It's a huge event. And I've been lucky to be a lot of events around the world. And, and it stacks up against any of the events I've been to, including the Super Bowl, Wimbledon, wow. French Open. Yep. I've been to a lot of great sporting events. 
I then came and lived in America. I've got an American wife. Um, she's from near San Jose, a place called uh, Saratoga. Lived in America for, for, for 10 months. Did a lot of research around sporting teams and you know, hung out with some really cool people, which was great. And then I took over coaching the Sydney Swans in 2002, midway through 2002, when the senior coach stood down. And then, and we'll go into more detail, but this is the broad thing. So I uh, won the, the Super Bowl, won the premiership with the Sydney Swans for the first time in 72 years in 2005, which was an amazing achievement for the football club and, and everyone in the history. Uh, coached there for eight and a half years, did a succession plan with John Longmire, who's still the coach, and they're still a really successful organisation. Got seconded out of retirement, went to Melbourne Football Club, who were, I think they had the fifth worst season in AFL history the year before I got there. Won two games, lost 20. It had six years of, of losing. Went there on the proviso that I'd only be there for three years. We'd put a succession plan in place. So I was there for three years, got them to about a 500 team from two wins, got them to 10 wins and 12 losses. And they won the premiership last year under the coach that we put in as a succession plan, which was the first time they'd won in 50 something years. So yeah, so that's a bit of the backstory. So look, it's probably likened to the NFL really, what the NFL represents to American sport. Australian rules represents to Australian sport. And I mean, a meal's well placed to, to sort of chat. It's hard when you're in the sport because you know, you're know you immersed in it. But um, yeah, that's my that's sort of my story. And then I met Emil uh, about four or five years ago. We started the company Performance by Design, four really like-minded um, people that put the company together. And we're really passionate about, most of our work is in the corporate world. You know, 95% of the work is in that corporate world, 5% work is in sport, but sport really sharpens you up yeah. for the corporate world. But we're really passionate about bringing a lot of sporting ideologies to the workplace and making huge change and um, Emil's in Toronto. He can speak for himself. And we've just set up our business in, in the US as well. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. Em, go. Um, well, I've already been on your, on the podcast. So, um, yeah. People I, already love him, mate. Yeah, but they love him. Hey, but he's got to remind them. Come on. Hey, remind them all they love him. Let's weird. go. <laughs> I, think, I think my journey into, into this work was, was through my own company, Aussie X. I built a company here. Um, I started the first version of it back in 2003 where I, I grabbed a bunch of Aussie rules football gear from Australia and shipped it over and went around to schools and taught them a crazy game of foot. It was a wonderful experience, although day one, I was only 24 at the time, I went to rent a car and uh, got to the budget rent a car and the lady said, oh, Mr. Studham, you're only 23, 24. Um, you need to be 25 to rent a car. So I grabbed my bow, a hockey bag filled with footies and caught public transport to, to teach these kids in schools. It was a wonderful experience. Um, four years later, came back and built Aussie X, which was then bought footy, cricket and netball, and then it grew into other physical activity, um, all centred around helping children go from no, I can't to yes, I can in the physical realm, not building sports stars as much as uh, making the connection that physical activity made them feel good, irrespective of their ability at sport. And three years into that journey, um, two pivotal things happened. I started to break down as a leader. I was struggling to, to share decision-making power. I was bottlenecking the business and I wasn't having honest conversations with my team in relation to what wasn't working. I fell into the trap of believing that as a, as a leader, I had to fix everyone's problems. Um, but that thing, that coincided with getting on Dragon's Den um, here in Canada. So that was a wonderful experience. But luckily for me, um, I had been tracking the company that had sort of coached Rusey on our model to win the Sydney Swans 2005 Premiership and revolutionise our sport and befriended Jared Murphy, who's our other business partner, one of our other business partners. And then Jez actually turned up on November 1st to 11, eight days before we went live on Dragon's Den. <clears throat> so it's funny my voice went bad then because that's how my voice felt right around when Jez turned up because... Uh, I was really struggling with, with the demands of leadership. The team was growing at a rate that I couldn't control. Um, but then as I went through the first version of what we do today and learned how to create that clarity on who we are and what we stand for, um, understand the individual differences within the group and understand myself better, and then train and practice real talk, it completely changed my life for the better. And then as I implemented a version of the PBD system into Aussie X, the business kept growing. I kept getting stronger. The team kept getting stronger. And I started doing less, less and less. 
got into this consulting game by just offering my services to my mates because they were seeing the culture and performance that we were building. I mean, in two years, I got kicked out of that company by my team and have been doing this work ever since. And then in 2016, as I was exiting that company, I saw Rusey on TV on a show and I wrote him a letter <laughs> and I said, hey, Rusey, I'm, I've worked with his ex-movement Aussie X company. I'm in leadership and mindfulness. He'd spoken about that, that he and Tammy wanted to get into. We wrote an email. I exited the company. We caught up for a coffee and within six months, we were four business partners and we built Performance by Design together. That's pretty amazing, man. I mean, first of all, um, Dragon. Like, like, I mean, being on Dragons then got you your nickname, Dragon, right? So, Dragon, so for you, you had an entrepreneurial journey. It was... Yes. It had its highs, it had its lows. And yeah. when you found out about this incredible methodology that Ruzi developed to take yeah. the Sydney Swans to their first championship in over 70 years, yeah, you implemented your company, magic happened. The company exploded and your uh, services were no longer necessary. That's the greatest yeah. testament to leadership. <laughs> and when yeah. the, the leader makes himself redundant. redundant. Uh, well, yeah. in fact, they kicked me out. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And Ruzi, right. so, you know, this is a pretty incredible thing because a lot of people, let's face it, look at athletes in, in North America, we call them jocks. And that's mm. not exactly a term of endearment. It, it mm. basically means you're, you're, you're dumb jock, right? You don't have yeah. a lot of brain power. You don't have the ability to think things through. You're just a physical beast. But obviously that stereotypical view of athletes is wrong. I mean, it's... <laughs> People have been doing stupid stereotypes to people all, for all kinds of reasons throughout history. And that, that's one of the dumber ones because athletes, because of the fact that they exercise, they actually tend to be smarter than the average bear because all that exercise <laughs> really allows for more blood oxygen to go to the brain. So that actually allows the brain cells to, to become sharper and smarter. So you developed something pretty impressive and, and amazing and you created great results. I really like you to just unpack that for us. How did that come to be? Yeah, so I was really lucky. So when I went to Fitzroy, because let, let's let's unpack some of the philosophy. What is culture? Yeah. Like, it's really interesting. Like, I probably had no idea. So I'm a 16-year-old kid. I arrive at Fitzroy. I'm not going there for culture. I'm going there to kick the footy and try and make money and try and, you know, be a, a semi-professional athlete. But probably when I was named captain um, in about 1986 or 87, I realized what culture was. It was simply the behaviors of the leaders. All right, so I'll say that again. It's the behaviors of the leaders and the centers of influence. Yeah. And I was really fortunate that the, the, the leaders and centers of influence of Fitzroy were really good guys, really good fellas on the field and off the field. And I realized that as a result, and I think I was heading to be a pretty good person, but as a result, I picked up, because a young person just wants to fit in. You want to fit in. If, if the senior player's going to the pub before the game on a Thursday night and getting drunk, that's where you are. Yeah. If the senior player's home with his wife in bed and the senior coach is calling you, that's where you are. You're watching a movie or whatever. So let's be really clear on the culture is the actions of the leaders. We talk about role model leadership. So I played for 17 years. And then one of the things I did, which I'd, I'd recommend to anyone listening to this podcast to do, Okay, I wrote down in 1998, so I retired in 1998, I wrote down the things I liked about my leaders and the things I didn't like about my leaders. Yeah. So in that period is when Australian rules football was transitioning away from this top-down approach to a more empathetic leader. And I'm like, well, I'm a player, right? What do I want from a leader? And if I become a leader or a coach, I need to remember what it was like to be a player. And it was 20, happened to be 25 points. And I had it in my desk for eight and a half years. I coached Sydney and the three years that I came out and coached Melbourne. It was by far the best document because it held me accountable to the leader I wanted to be. Another way to look at it, are you the leader you wish you had? Okay, I'll say that again. Are you the leader you wish you had? So then I arrived at Sydney and I said, well, okay, we've got some good people. How do we systemize? culture how do we not leave culture to chance and really that's our mission at performance by design how do we not leave culture to chance yeah. so we set up our culture code we went to a place called coffs harbor over two days we set up a culture code this is what we're going to be and that's the whole coaching group the whole player group it was first time it ever happened in afl football this is our culture code we then elected our leadership group not based on 
who the best player was and who the longest serving player was, purely and simply based on our culture code. We elected our leadership group and then we put the system in place of reward and challenge, review and preview. So that's a really simple way, Nikki, of sort of running through exactly what it looked like. And to the players' credit, they were ready for it. They said, okay, if we want to shape our football club. We want this football club to be successful and we're happy to take responsibility for it. Um, and we, three years later, we were picked to finish bottom of the ladder in 2003, the year I took over. We made the, the, the top four, got knocked out the round before the grand final Super Bowl. Next year, we missed a, We played in the finals again. So we went from a team that wasn't even picked to basically bottom team. We'd lost a lot of senior players. And then year three, we won the premiership, which was the first time in 72 years. So I think that's why you know, I'm so passionate about it because I've seen it work. I know it works. I know what the obstacles are in the way. And I know the processes you have to put in place um, to be able to get it done properly. Yeah. I think the thing part there that's really worth listening for the listeners is, is the, simple, the, the, the simple and practical system that it is. I see in, in the work that I do now and we do, I see everyone trying to fucking like this, make it more complicated than it is, right? Like it, and, Man, and the other being human, around, brother, we all do that. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a human condition, right? So what Ruzi and the system, um, and makes me so uh, sort of uh, enjoyable is that we take the complexity of a bunch of humans because there's a lot of complexity, right? We do a lot of work in the psychometric profiling space, so. Even at the moment, I'm doing another course on it. And just the depth of the human psyche is crazy. So as leaders, we need to actually bring all that complexity and go, right, who are we? What do we stand for? Who are we as individuals? And what natural strengths do we bring to the table and gifts do we give to each other? And then how do we conduct honest conversations wrapped around who we want to be and what we stand for? And then just simply embed a cadence, a meeting cadence that's very intentional and relevant. And then review against our code. And that's exactly what Jared, who got thank you, came along because I was ready to get in a canoe and I don't know how I was going to get back to Australia, but I didn't want to be in my own business, 50, 60 people alone, unable to speak my truth in the company that, and so many leaders struggle with this, the company that they built, and now they've got the system, they must segregate themselves. And that's, I just don't think that's completely right. So you have to get clear on what culture is as a connection to performance, and it's not the party's perks and ping pong. It's the behaviours that the leaders role model and then the system that enables those behaviours to consistently be lived and challenged and rewarded. <laughs> Full you know, stop. Full stop. Well said. You know, <laughs> you, you, listen, I've been taking some notes on what you're saying. There are three things that stood out to me in what both you and Ruzi said, okay? So the first thing was when Ruzi defined culture as the behaviours of the leaders. Yeah. So that's powerful because not every not everybody defines it that way. In fact, I would argue nobody else defines it that way. <laughs> but it, it's really on point if you think about it. And then the second point is, are you the leader you wish you had? Are you the leader you wish you had? You know what? If I if I ask myself that question, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. yeah. The answer is no. I'm a bit uh, I'm a bit of an asshole at times, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And that's definitely not the leader I wish I had. It was, it was, a, it was a bit of an arse, you know? And um, I'm also sometimes too caught up in my own BS mm. to really understand the big picture and to really empower people around me. Now, sometimes I'm great, but sometimes I suck. You know yeah. what I mean? And... The other thing that jumped out at me was when you spoke about the culture code. What is your mm. culture code? And I'm like, what is my culture code? Well, you know, I, those are questions that I'd really like to answer for myself powerfully. Tentatively, I'd say right now, it's driven by, uh, on my end, a desire to prove something, a desire to get out there and, and recruit and build movements and enroll. So I'm a recruiter and an enroller. So that's part of my culture code. I display that as a behavior. And I actually think, Em, I had a conversation yesterday with somebody. I think that's my greatest thought leadership is connecting people and recruiting people to do stuff. Because I know a lot of stuff. But 
that was pretty cool. And then the whole aspect of reward and challenge, reward and challenge. Dang, man, that's really cool. And then, and when you talked about psychometric profiling, I thought that was so cool because I, yeah. I, I, I hear people doing psychometric tests and, and, and things like that, but they just do it to see if the person's a good fit for the job. Yeah. They're, not, they're not doing it to see how can we get the best out of this person because in the context of team in the, yeah, con in the context the of team context not whether team. whether i can get the best uh, out of this person if they fit my idea of what this person should be like in a job yeah, so that's right. very powerful and interesting so rosie build on this for me brother yeah yeah well i mean the thing that we i think well, let's let's start with unpack some of them think about the things that we start to do when we are walking into a party, when we're walking into somewhere we've never been before, a cafe or restaurant, or, because let's really break it down. What are the, what's the owner doing? Okay, well, I noticed that I've got to sit down because the waiter's coming to me. So even simple things like that, how quickly do we fall in line with what the rules of the organisation are? Who, who typically dictates that? So, so it, it's sort of common sense. So when I, go to, when I go to Fitzroy, I look at our best players, Gary Wilson, Bernie Quinlan, Laurie Serafini, Mickey Conlon. What are they doing? So to your, and, I'll, and I want to break this down. So then I finish my career and I go, okay, there's some things that I like, but there's also some things that I don't like. I had probably five or six coaches, to your point. But a lot of what I'm about to embark on is human nature because I've learned habits through them. Mm. My point. So suddenly I've got these habits, which I don't necessarily like. And you were really honest, Nikki. You've developed habits of leaders that you had. And you're really honest now. And I say this all the time. You do an audit of yourself and write it down honestly, what you're doing well, and what you liked and didn't like. I guarantee you'd be doing stuff you said you hated. I guarantee it. Because mm. simply it's a learned behavior. We walk into the organization. We look at the coach. We look at the senior players. We fit in. Even if we don't like it, we typically fit in. It's not until maybe year five or six or seven where we start to question whether those behaviours are right, but there's a certain point where they become habits. So when we become a leader, we start doing all this shit that we hate it because, <laughs> because it was sort of done, done to us. Yeah, that's right. And the next phase, which was really interesting phase, was how do we not lose a chance? And when I took over at Sydney... Look, we were a pretty good team. We were, you know, five or six out of 10. We had really good people. So it wasn't like it was a basket case at all. It was actually a, a pretty good organisation. But I thought to myself, how do we harness the good in this group, discard the bad and make a culture code out of it? And I, Nikki, I honestly believe, and Emil, you can jump in. I honestly believe why people, people love concepts like, as we all do, Brene Brown, you know, psychological safety and the, the, the speed of trust and all that sort of stuff. I just don't think they know how to put it into a system in a workplace. Yeah. If you don't have a culture code, it's almost impossible. How do I give yeah. feedback yeah. to a meal? What's you the reference know point? What feedback's given on. How do I create a psychological safe environment if that's not in our culture code? How do we build trust if we haven't systemized our culture? Where everyone's guessing. And the, the final thing before I hand over to M, because you mentioned too your your culture code we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching now mm. you can't say i'm honest and lie <laughs> yeah. you can't you can't say something and do something else yeah and the number of times we see it in a business where people so just because you put shit up on the board that says honesty supportive trusting if your actions are completely different yeah people don't leave work and go to their wives or their husbands or partners at the end of the day oh we were honest today yeah, because it says it on the wall. What, what they say is, we've got a bunch of dickheads running this company. <laughs> and the wife or the husband or the partner goes, but aren't you, hang on, I just got on your website and it says honest, yeah. trustworthy and supportive. It's I know what it is. It's the end of the what part, actions, it? Yeah, I'll tell you what our actions are. We lie. We talk behind people back. We don't support each other. So you can't be something other than what you are. Does that make sense? It totally care. makes put, sense, man. You can put as much. One of the first things I did when I went to the Melbourne Football Club, as I said, there were two wins in 20. And this was, wasn't being disrespectful. I was about to paint 
the uh, the offices that I walked into, and they had all this stuff written on the wall. I said to the football manager, "Fantastic, paint over all of it because it doesn't mean anything. anything yeah. It does not mean anything. Leave the Premiership Cups we we won in the fifties and you know, all the cool memorabilia because that's history. That's real. That's that's us." But all the bullshit on the wall, yeah. that's garbage. Until we can live our DNA. So start with the culture code, the profiling exams I love because... Yeah, the profiling's great. Normally it's, here's your profile, Nikki. Bang, there's your strengths and weaknesses. There's your computer. There's your desk. Good luck. Well, we break it down into understanding yourself and understanding others and how we work really well together. We then do really cool relationship building exercises because if we're going to have real talk have honest conversations, the closer we are, think about the people in your life that you have the most honest conversations with. Probably your spouse, your kids, you know, because you have great relationships with them. Think about the ones you have the most superficial conversations, the ones that you don't know very well. Mm-hmm. So we've got relationships. And then after that, in our system, yeah. then we start to systemize, well, how do we give and receive honest feedback? And let's be clear as well. Yeah. Real talk as we talk about, is positive feedback as well. Yeah. It's not it's not just what you have to do better. It's well done, Emil. Thanks very much, mate. You're doing awesome stuff in Canada. All right. We've got to get away from this notion of the three-month review, the six-month review, and it's always negative because we, we want to get better. All right. No. Four to one. I think the ratio, yeah. Emil, four to one, positive to negative feedback. Tell people they're doing stuff really, really well. So and we want what do you want to pick up on that? Because yeah, that's really good. I think the catch the goods is important because um, often our engagement when we work with the corporate team, there actually is minimal to, to almost no recognition of, of what's working. So whenever we do get together, we only talk about what's not working. And, you know, one of the things we found in our journey is that most people do most things right most of the time. But if you're not getting recognised for it, we're not saying jump over, like, these are really simple stuff. Saw, what, saw that behaviour. Great, great presentation. You clearly rehearsed that and practiced that. Good stuff. That, that, that little and often recognition of what, like catch your mates doing it good, <laughs> right? Because the problem with only catching the result, Nikki, is you can get good results and behave badly. Yeah. And, and that's critical in business because if the scoreboard is money, which we could debate about that in another podcast, but if the scoreboard's ticking over, and this is what's happened with COVID, We've had these industries that have just gone whooshka because of COVID, you know, um, hand sanitizer and certain companies have made millions of dollars simply based on the fact that their product is required during a pandemic. Right. They've potentially built it with bad process, yeah. bad behaviour. Now that the pandemic's over, the curtain pulls back yeah. and it's a gong show. But because yeah. the scoreboard's ticking over, and Google was a prime example, eh? 20,000 people walked out day in 2018 because there was sexism and chauvinism and poor behaviour, but the scoreboard's ticking over a rate that you cannot even count in the thousands <laughs> as you're watching the money go up sort of thing. So catching the when we talk about catch the good, it's catch the good behaviour, right? Because you can't, on the flip side of that, you can get, you cannot get the result you're after but have great behaviours and great process. Like a pitch in business often the business is going to go to someone else. There's a cousin or an uncle who's going to, who's the decision maker of the other company, and you're just part of the RFP process. You do a great pitch, you do a great discovery, you present well. You're not going to then change what you've done because you didn't get the result. But I, we see that a bit. They change behaviour because they didn't get the result, but they weren't tracking the behaviours of the process that gets the results. So that's a big part of, of our work based on the fact that you can behave badly and get good results. That's a powerful point too, that you can behave badly and get good results. But before we get to that, I want to go to something Ruzi said. Um, Ruzi, you, you were you were talking about um, people in an organization, right, that um, would would say something and say, hey, I'm, I'm honest, and then they wouldn't, they'd lie. So I run a men's organization, okay? Um, and in this men's organization, it's a small organization at the moment, but my plan's to make it a lot bigger. We're about 20 odd men in the group. One of our key values, our standards of behavior is keep your word. And what we yeah. mean by keep your word is don't keep your word when it's convenient or when you feel like it or when the yeah. whim hits you. Uh, 
keep your word. So if you if you're giving your word as a man, we are living old school. We're kind of living like the standard of masculine behavior is 1950s and before the 6,000, 8,000 years of recorded history before that, which is man would rather die than break his word. And yes. there's a bunch of men in there who they come in, they go, yep, keep my word. I'm all in, man. That is so great. That's, that's, that's me. I'm that kind of man. And they're not. They're full of shit. They, they will give their word and then they'll break it. They'll break it. They'll take it back. And one dude, I said, hey, man, you said X. Now you're saying the exact opposite. What the hell? And he said, oh, my word, my choice. Like, this is an abortion debate, dude. No, you're not a, a lady who's deciding what to do with her with herself. You're a man who gave his word and we're yeah. teaching you. And you said you want to be a part of an organization that the mm. standard is you keep your word, not you keep your word when you feel like it or when it's convenient or any of that, but you just keep your word. And this dude had a shit bit that we called him out. He got upset. He couldn't handle it. He refused to have a conversation about it. So when I attempted to call him, he said, nothing to talk about. It's settled. I'm doing whatever I'm going to do. And a bunch of other men called him out, you know, uh, on it respectfully, but still called him out. No change, no nothing. And it just, it just, for me, how would you deal with, with a man in that situation? And I know it's not a corporate yeah. situation, but yeah. still. There's a short answer for that. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, to me, the, the first thing is you have the conversation. You know, yeah. that, that, that's if too many people don't have the conversation. So the fact that you called, and that's, we talk about it all the time. People are smart. People know what's happening. Everyone in that men's group would know that he's talking shit. Yeah. So, like, it's not a secret. It's not, but we, we, we tend to hide behind, geez, I hope Nicky didn't hear that. I hope yeah. Neil didn't hear that. And that's what I learned from football is, you have to put things on the table. And then I, I think all we can do, if you look at this men's group, all you can do is provide the parameters, really clear guidelines, and then people act their way in and or they act their way out. That's the short answer. Really simple. Yeah. I'll say that again. If you're really clear on your culture, whether it's work, the men's club, the footy club, the netball club, the softball club or whatever it is, and you're really clear, you're really supportive, and I want to make that clear. We're really supportive. We do the best we possibly can to get people on the bus. You act your way in or you act your way out. People will ask me to get often, Rusey, how hard was it to give players the flick at the end of the season? So you're talking about young yeah, men that are dream. aspiring to become AFL players, and you're sitting in front of them in you know, September, October, saying you're no longer at this footy club. And so it's a, it's a big thing. People will ask me all the time, my answer is most of it is easy because yeah. they've acted their way out of the system. Yeah. They've acted their way out of the system and we give so much feedback. So, so 99% of the players tell me by their actions, they don't want to be here. The absolute hardest ones are the ones that act well based on the culture code, but the skill component yeah, is not, just there. not there. Yet. That, is, that is difficult. Yeah, that is really difficult. Yeah, okay, they're the only ones that I lost sleep over. Yeah, the ones that were just trying as hard as they can, exemplary citizens. And there's a skill component in any business, yeah. but particularly in sport. And this, as we got better, their standards and their ability just wasn't good enough. They're hard, but the majority of people, mate, will get off the bus. Yeah, <laughs> if that's they, powerful. If you really on it. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. Now, Am, I want to address what you said, okay, um, around Google. And you're probably not going to like what I have to say, but yeah. there, there, there you have it. Um, I don't think the problem in the world today is that there's too much, too many men who are being chauvinist and, yeah. and being sexist toward women. I'm going to say something bold. I think the opposite's true. I think the world right now is too anti-man. They've decided that uh, if, if you're a man, you're fair game, you're bad. And all of a sudden, a man just trying to be a good man isn't even good enough anymore. And in a corporate situation, men are walking on eggshells, completely walking on eggshells. Um, and I, I wonder how that can be dealt with, with the kind of work that you're talking about. Because I think that's one of the big problems in the world today, is there's a lot of good men out there, sincere men trying to do good work. And they're afraid to even speak up because they're going to be fired. They're going to be, they're going to be treated badly or they're going to be falsely accused. 
I have yeah. a friend of mine who's a very senior man, owns a couple of companies, and he will not have a meeting alone in his room with a uh, with a with a with a woman. He just won't. He yeah. makes sure that there's someone else in the room. That's sad. That's horrible, in my opinion. But that's what he feels needs to happen. How do you deal with that kind of element that gets injected into culture? Yeah, it means it's a pretty big conversation. Um, that, can, I, that, can I jump in? Can I jump yeah, in? Because. Go. I reckon the biggest thing, Nikki, is because to your point, I think the work that we do doesn't differentiate. And part of the problem yeah, that's is exactly it's behavior the conversation. It tends to become, you know, segregated in whatever that thing is. But I've never seen more segregation in terms of whether that's mandates or lockdowns or, you know, to your point, the, the men versus women. I think what we do is try and bring everyone together on a common set of goals. Yeah, and I think yeah, that's yeah. a really. I think as a society and life, I reckon what I've learned over the last two years through the pandemic is why can't we come together? Mm. Why, why do we always have to push each other away? You know, a, one of the best things, a rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah, if we John continue, F. Kennedy, baby. My favourite Democrat president. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah. yeah, a rising tide lifts all boats. We have to, and that's, thing, and that's what we do well. Yeah, that's we right. don't say this culture code is for this group of people or that group of people no. or that group of people. What we say is in this organisation, regardless yeah. of what the organisation is, this is how we want to act. And I reckon that's really powerful. In a sense, I'm going to take a, a similar view, but an opposite view, Nikki, to say we've got to stop segregating people yeah. and look at it from what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, what's good behaviour, what's bad behaviour. Yeah. And I think if we pull everything back to that, and that's what we do. We try to say, well, you know, let's pull everything back to go, here is our culture code. Because the moments that I get most annoyed with I mean, in our workshops is when we start giving the real talk and the last work part top and we start, you know, talking about someone and then we go, oh yeah, but that's just the way M is. Now, hang on. Yeah. We're now making excuses for poor behavior. That's yeah. what we're saying. Instead of what we're saying, we should be saying, this is our behaviors. Yeah. This is what we stand for. M, you're not doing this well done. You're doing this really, really well. Yeah. But if we break it down into what we create, and we create it together. Yeah. What the demographic is, our background, yeah. our, and the things we do. We create our culture code as a team together. And then we agree on our behaviours, and then we build strong relationships. We do our profiling, and then we have really honest conversations. And I think yeah. if we can stick to that. Simple. Then simple, simple, simple. We pull everyone together rather than pushing everyone away. Yeah. I like the concept a lot. I think it's powerful. And like M said, it's a bigger conversation than, than just yeah. this podcast, what I'm saying. But I think that uh, right, 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 right now for me, um, like you, Ruzi, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in speaking the truth. When these mandates and lockdowns came out, you know, initially we didn't know. So we were properly yeah. cautious, but then it became yeah. clear we were being sold a bill of goods. Yeah, it, beca yeah. it became oh, clear that, that, uh, that we 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 would need to we would need to speak up for our freedoms because if we didn't do that, you know those freedoms could be taken away. And I think that's an important thing to do. That truth can't just be something that we do uh, privately or personally uh, yeah. among the people we love. It needs to be something to your point that can be done inside an organization with the context of bringing people together, but also needs yeah. to be done society wide because otherwise, if you give these government types more more leeway, they're going to lock us down forever. They're going to yeah, demand yeah. that we do whatever the heck they want, and we won't have I any agree. freedom left. Let's look at the last two years, and let's let's continue the conversation about leadership. Mm. This is the greatest leadership survey that's ever been done. In, in incidentally, might add, because but what is the only difference in each country? The pandemic is fundamentally the same. Yeah. Okay. The the, the virus is the same. So so forget which side of the spectrums you sit on. Okay, and 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 all the different theories. The doctors have pretty much educated in the same place. The vaccine is the same in every single country. The pandemic is the same in every single... What's the difference? Leadership. Leadership. That's the only difference in every country. Why does Sweden do what they did? Leadership. Why did Toronto, Canada do what they did? Leadership. Why did Australia do what they did? Leadership. So if you, if you don't understand the power of the leader yeah. and, and creating a culture and role model leadership, 
you've got a really good insight yeah. in the last two years, all right? And also you've got a really good insight into what good, good leadership looks like and what bad leadership looks like. And to your point, yeah. Nikki, yeah. speak up, real yeah. talk. Have real the talk. <laughs> yeah. real well talk. said, I mean, it just, it goes back to what you guys created, well said. I've been lucky enough to work in India, um, part of the States throughout Australia and here in Canada. And Ruzi's right, irrespective of the cultures, the sexual preferences, the age, it, it's when we get in a room together and go, hey, what do we stand for? It's going through the process of our question pattern. Um, I don't care where you're from or what you've done. Um, it becomes pretty simple that that's, you know, because of one of the problems Nikki, that the corporate sector does the a group of individuals at high level will go and create, I'll go spend six months and build these corporate values and they go, right, thank God that's over. This is yeah. this is these are our values, like <laughs> you know, and they look at it like a project or a campaign when culture is a behavior-driven thing, so it's a doing thing. So now if we've got this code, if we don't do anything about it, and by that use it to conduct conversations and review performance and reward and challenge each other, then it's just like Enron in granite at their New York, Manhattan, you know, integrity, communication, respect and excellence in this beautiful foyer in granite and look at everything that they did, right? Um, I'm going to touch on something, Nikki, you said, so which is what you're saying. So we did a, we did a, a workshop um, Murph and I, we flew in. I'm not going to say who it was. Okay, the, the CEO of this company got up and for 45 minutes spoke about team. For articulate, magnificent team, 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 team. And pretty much why Murph and I were there. For 45 minutes, we did our stuff. They'd asked me to do a team building exercise on the Wednesday morning. We got up six o'clock. Like I got tennis rackets out him. You would have loved it. It was funny. Bikes and tennis courts. It was a really cool. Guess who didn't turn up? <laughs> CEO. The CEO did not turn up. He was off riding a bike with himself. So he's His got whole it. mandate was about team, which is exactly yeah. Nikki and M what you're saying. You can't yeah. say this and do yeah. something else. So what, what do you think everyone in the meeting sort of that thought? Case. Like immediately, hang on, you've talked yeah. about team. We have a team building exercise and you don't turn up. It's, it's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. It really is. Some of the stuff we see is just, what are you doing? Like, and, and yeah, I don't know, but that's not, that's the problem. There's no, there is little in the way of leadership training and just the basics i had a chat with you know joe terry Barbarizzi, and we had a great chin wag a while back and just realized that the work that we do is life <laughs> like yeah, it's, yeah. it's just life like it's this it's yeah. the basics of life and i've done a fair bit of work actually in a previous few years um in schools mm. and, and ran our process with grade three kids and grade eight and school teaching, actually where the original company did a lot of work in broken schools in country Victoria and got teachers together and said, well, hang on, if, if these kids are all over the shop, that's on us. So what do we need to own and role model so yeah. that our needy children can have something to, I mean, that's what a role model is. You want to be like them, be yeah. behaviour like them. <clears throat> Uh, it's well said, man. It's well said. What you guys are doing is pretty amazing. And I think everybody should consider learning from you guys. You know, you got to You got to get your, your book out there, which we've talked about. Yeah. And you should be handing that to, to, to people that you work with. But you should also be handing it to people that are in in senior positions of influence in organizations. I think every sports team, every major professional sports team in the world should get a copy of it. And that's going to make the world a better place right there. So, um, Em, if folks want to find out about your work, if they want to book a call to have a strategy meeting, yeah. what's the best way? Yeah, yeah we do. Uh, we do do um, for your viewers, Nikki. More than happy to do a complimentary sort of culture and performance diagnostic. Uh, it takes about thirty to forty-five minutes on um, over Zoom. So you can reach us performance by design 
amil.co is our website. You can reach me directly at Emil, E-M-I-L-E, at performancebydesign.co. We have our LinkedIn page. That's where we mostly, you can see, we've got a great um, YouTube show that host, that Ruzi hosts called The Culture Couch Live, as well as The Culture Couch. And I do a few every now and then over here called The Culture Corner. So that can be found off of our website as well. Um, but yeah, like I said, it starts with actually looking at yourself in the mirror. And that's what the culture <laughs> diagnostic is, you know. Um, how would we be described today and how do you want to be described and what's the, what's the gap? Um, and in the gap, there's behaviour. So getting clear on that's the first step to the work. And I think on that, Nikki, one of the things about leadership is self-awareness. Just no one's expecting you to know everything. I think <laughs> if that's a starting point, yeah. the best leaders I know are really aware of what they're not good at, you know, which is fine. So reach out. Yeah, you know, we believe we're, you know, we're, we're a smart people, good company, et cetera, et cetera. We'll learn off people as well, you know. But I think that's the thing. Don't... That notion of being a leader, particularly for your fraternity too, Nikki, about you know, if you've got a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of startups, get the culture sorted out as soon as you can because then you can hire on it. Yeah. It's really important. You can get your value set in stone really quickly and it can be the roadmap to your success and people leave the values or they drop off. You know, they, they act their way in, they act their way out. So don't sit there and think, oh, yeah, but if I get a company in, you know, that, that, that's failing as a leader absolutely the no, opposite, opposite. yeah but it put me further from the truth yeah. like i would never take a coaching job now without getting performance by design coming in and doing the culture it, i just simply wouldn't yeah. i just wouldn't do it because it just doesn't make any sense to me knowing the power of the system all right so great leadership is great self-awareness surrounding yourself with people that compliment you you know we all have weaknesses and we all have strengths okay there's no such thing as a perfect leader so yeah. for the people out there Get it done as quickly as you can, you know, and the sooner you get it done, the sooner you embed it. And you touched on it early. It's powerful. It really yeah. is powerful when you yeah, get your is. culture right. We, we yeah. know that. Yeah. You know, getting, um, getting good results and behaving badly is a thing that a lot of people do. Uh, yeah. You know, you heard about a Amazon as an example, yeah. great results as a company, but they won't even let people take pee breaks. That's like insane. You know what I'm saying? Like absolutely insane. So you you got to have the conversation with with people in their organization to get them to feel like they can go and say, "Hey guys, you may be the you know the one of the largest companies in the world, but this isn't working. This is going to all implode if you don't figure it out because everybody has an upswing and everybody's got a downswing. You know, and if Amazon is smart, and I'm picking on Amazon, but they're not the only one that's that's got issues with how they behave and, and gets really, really good results, they're going to do something about this. Because if they don't, they're going to be GM. They're going to be IBM. They're, 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 they're going to be all these companies that did really, really well. Then all of a sudden became very arrogant, had a ton of hubris. And this is this a not invented here syndrome starts to take over for them. And boom, game over as far as they're concerned. Yeah. yeah, I talk about, Nikki, behavioural-based organisations and talent-based organisations. Yeah. Completely different. A behavioural-based organisation doesn't have the peaks and troughs. Yeah, now you might lose some talent. Yeah, you might go down slightly. But a talent-based organisation is purely based on product and talent and it's just it's just not sustainable, you know, because, as you said, the culture gets eroded, 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 whereas a behavioural-based organisation is completely yeah. different. You know, so what you want to aspire to be is a behavioural based organisation with really good talent. And then that's that's really, really cool when that happens because you get in this zone, you know, and it's really, really good. So look, we like to end off each and every single one of our episodes by asking you, our guest experts, for your top three expert action steps. These are your best pieces of advice that you recommend my listener take on to improve their life or their business. So what say you? Um, I would, it, would, it would actually be for me, it would be the spend some time getting clear on who you are and what you stand for. Basically what Ruzi said at the start, what the question would be, who's, who's the leader I wish I had or who's the leader I want to be, right? What are the descriptive words and then the behaviours that support that, that's, that becomes your individual leadership code. 
right? Then I would then secondly go out and spend some money on a tool, whether it's insights discovery, which is what we prefer to use because the reporting so good and simple, or a disk or something like that to understand yourself better, right? And then the third thing would be um, find someone to practice some real talk with. Show them your individual leadership code, someone close with you and say, hey, can you give me feedback on this, right? This code, this is who I am, what I, this is who I am, what I, what I stand for. Where do you see me living this and where do you see I can improve? And because it'll have behaviour in it, the, the feedback and the real talk essentially will catch the good and catch the areas of growth, but in context of the leader you want to be, right? And it's even better if it's actually, you know, that's kind of the part that we do really well is facilitate that conversation. But it's got to start with your code, understanding individual differences, and then um, practicing the real talk. So they're the, they're the three steps that I would, and in that, that order is important. Yeah, good, mate. So, I mean, obviously I would piggyback off the back of them, so I'll pick three other ones. I read a really good article recently about positive leadership. And I think the, the, the guts of it was, and I'll say this, when you walk in a room, are you giving energy or are you sucking it out of the room? Here comes Nikki, here comes Ruzi, I've got to get out of here. Just quick. Okay. So are you an energy giver, all right, or are you an energy taker? Be an energy giver. Now, to do that, look after yourself. Make sure you're turning up the best version of yourself. If you need to meditate, meditate in the morning. If you want to go for a walk, eat well. I think leaders don't look after themselves enough, like from a physical, spiritual, yeah. emotional standpoint. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Look, start with yourself. Look yourself in the mirror. And if you can do that, people, you will walk in the office in the morning and people will go, oh, great, Nikki's here. Hey, mate, how are you? Yeah. Because you know that you're emanating energy, which I think is really important. Okay, that'd be, that'd be one on the back of meals. Yeah. So let's call it four. Five is use your network. There's no such thing as a coincidence. There's no perfect leader. Use opportunities to learn. Gee, Nikki, that, when Emil rings me and says, oh, can we get on the with Nikki? Absolutely. Like, like I'm 58, but one of the fortunate things that I've been involved in is sport. You meet so many good people, but too many people don't see the opportunity that exists because oh, I already know this and I can't learn from them. So take every opportunity as a personal development opportunity. I think, I think that's really, really important. I think the third thing is just digest, again, probably more specifically to this, digest what we're talking about. It's common sense. Yeah, it's common sense. Sort of know it, okay? So as we get to the end of this interview, I want you to think about it from the point of view, you actually know that. Now I'm going to put it into practice. Yeah. Right? I'm going to get it out of my head, which I know. I'm going to get it in... The, and I'm sure, Em, when you talked about your journey, you knew you were getting in the way, but I wasn't really sure how to get it out of my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Systemize it, okay? It's common sense. The common sense is not that common, all right? So take it out of your head and try and systemize whatever the system that you're in or whatever you're trying to improve. That might be family. That might be the local sporting organization. That might be the local community. That might be your relationship with your, your mum, your dad, your sister, your brother. Think about it from that point of view. What can I systemize? And we're talking a lot about um, workplaces and cult, which absolutely you can. Yeah. Right. So look at look at this podcast and go. Yeah, I think I do know what they're talking about. because you do. Yeah. We all really do, but we just need a little bit of a a kick in the the backside every now and then to go. Yeah, I'm going to do it. So don't put it on hold. Don't keep making excuses. Do it. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Yeah, man, these are awesome expert action steps, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate having both of you on. It's been a great conversation, a lot of positive, high energy stuff. And hey, we had a bit of a spirited discussion in, in the middle of it, which is always fantastic too. Please come back and share your wisdom with us again. I want to delve into some of the stuff with you again uh, and, and go deeper into some of the aspects you talked about. I think we could we could spend just an hour talking about culture code. We could spend an hour about getting good results and behaving badly. We could spend an hour on reward and challenge, right? We could spend yeah. an hour on the importance of, you know, uh, habits as learned behaviors. We could spend an hour just saying that culture is the behavior of leaders. 
Mm. And, and I just think this is awesome. This is fantastic stuff. So let's make sure that we do that. Yeah. So, listener, Ruzi and Dragon, these men are the real deal. Go to their website, performancebydesign.co. Take them up on their offer to do a culture diagnostic. They're going to be putting a book out soon. They're going to do a bunch more interviews with me. They got their YouTube channels. Take advantage of all that. Okay, make sure that you do that. Listen, if you like this episode and you know someone who needs this message, give it to them. Share the episode. That's your job. Be a giver, not a taker, as Ruzi said. Give, 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 give the gift of the greatness of the Thought Leader Revolution podcast and our incredible guest today. All right. And if you need some help with your personal brand, with taking that to a whole new level, if you need to grow your business because you're stagnating, go to eCircleAcademy.com. Use all the resources we have there. And we offer a free diagnostic session too on what's going on with your business, what we need to do to add an extra six figures, seven figures, even eight figures to it. Make sure you take advantage of that. M, Ruzi, thanks so thanks much for coming on. Good on you, Nikki. Really, really a lot. Thanks, Ruzi. Great yeah. conversation. Yeah, thanks, it really you. was. It really was. And that wraps up another exciting episode of the podcast, The Thought Leader Revolution. To find out more about today's incredible guests, the two and only Dragon and Ruzi, go to the show notes at thethoughtleaderrevolution.com or the show notes, wherever you happen to listen to this podcast, be it iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or Audible. Until next time, goodbye. This episode has been brought to you by eCircleAcademy.com, the proven system to add six to seven figures a year to your thought leader practice.